So today I'm joined uh, by Thomas Back, who has, has been a great speaker at a number of events in the language community at the Polyglot Conference and at the Edinburgh Language Event uh, at the end of the, well, the start of the, poly, the COVID uh, pandemic. And um, we're talking today because we're work, working on a project together this year. And it's something that you have been championing now for is it three years. This will be year three, right, for this project. Yes. And, and it's to show under the banner of multilingual is normal. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the hashtag that you've used uh, so far. And we're going to be adding to that, I think, this year as well with multilingual day. And if they have a multilingual Monday as well to add into the mix to get people thinking about multilingualism. Um, so why do we need a day to celebrate multilingualism? Well, I think that's a very important question to start with. At the moment, we have two days, which are kind of special days, the uh, dedicated days, which are in some way related with languages. One is 26th of September, and that is European Day of Languages. But per definition, it is a European day, so it's not necessarily you know, for all the languages of the world. The other is in fact coming quite soon, it's 21st of February, and that is the International Mother Language Day, and uh, that has been, uh, so to say, created to commemorate Bangladesh's struggle to have Bengali recognized as the official language, rather than Urdu, which was, so to say, the language before. So I think it's a very important occasion because it shows, so to say, the, the importance of all languages, not having just you know, one language which is imposed on people who might at home be speaking a different language. But it is very much, so to say, about the mother language. It's about the languages that we learn in childhood. And although this is very important indeed, I, what I find equally important to add is that we learn languages not only in childhood. We learn languages across all our life. And in fact, much of my work is about language learning across lifespan. In fact, even in third age, in people who are retired, I mean, I'm interested in people, you know, up to 85 who kind of start learning a new language. So from this point of view, I think that they, as important as the International Day of, um, uh, I mean, uh, mother language is, and in fact, a few years ago, I think five years ago, Dina Mehmet Begovic and myself launched a website on this day to commemorate it, Healthy Linguistic Diet. So I think it's a very, very important occasion, but, it is very much focused on the languages we, which we learn as children. And that is the languages which are not really chosen by us, which are chosen by circumstances. Mm -hmm. I cannot say, well, I would quite like to have, you know, a Chinese mother and a Bengali speaking father. <laughs> I have what I have, so to say, in terms of the languages that I was told as a, as a baby, as a small child. However, as I say, what I would like to stress is that we learn languages all the time. We have a choice which languages we continue to use or discontinue, which languages we learn new. And there is no occasion for something like this. And that's why I think for me, the International Day of Multilingualism has a broader scope than the two days that we have before, because it is not confined to Europe like 20. 6th of September, and is not confined to languages that we acquire as children, as is the 21st of February. So really, everyone who's been learning languages from whatever age can join in the fun of, of this day. Exactly. exactly. So I, I would like to have it an open day for anybody who has any interest in languages. And it's on the 27th of March, this International Day of Multilingualism. Why that day in particular? Well, I mean, a few years ago, I discovered that 27th of March is the day which is engraved on Rosetta Stone, which I think is possibly the most famous multilingual document that we have in world history. And I like the idea of Rosetta Stone for many reasons. Firstly, it's really something that most people have heard about. It is an, probably the most famous object in, or one of the most famous objects definitely in British Museum, one of the most iconic objects that we know. It is also a document that in fact, different languages were spoken, translated and so on, as long as the humanity was there. Mm 
There is a widespread idea that multilingualism is something very new. It's a new phenomenon which came up with globalization, with internet, maybe with big migration movements and so on. But in fact, we have good reasons to believe that human language evolved originally in multilingual settings. Most hunter-gatherer societies that still exist in the world are very multilingual, and many early agricultural societies. So from this point of view, I would say the, the nice thing about the, about the Rosetta Stone is it shows it is not just a new phenomenon of the last decade or two, or two. it is something which has been part of the heritage of humanity practically since we became homo sapiens and since human language developed. Yeah, multilingualism definitely is something that's been with society for a long, long time, as you rightly said. Um, but how normal is being multilingual nowadays? Uh, well, I mean, it depends where you go. So I would say, I mean, multilingualism, I mean, the, or the idea that in fact you have uh, use of different languages in society has been very old and you know you find them everywhere in the world and uh, some people would say well but it came a little bit less when you had big states well not necessarily because for instance you had very multilingual empires so for instance the old persian empire was incredibly multilingual leaving a big i mean one of the reasons why we know so much about uh, about languages of the middle east is because there are so many multilingual inscriptions so people were very well aware of different languages and were using them were translating texts and so on and so on were adapting the writing to these different languages so uh, I would say it has been very, very common uh, across history and probably the kind of biggest advance of monolingualism was the creation of nation states in which a country decided to be a kind of nation which has only one language and this language was reinforced, was reinforced through schools, was reinforced through uh, official language standards through uh, later mass media and so on and so on. So from this point of view, I would say monolingualism is a relatively recent phenomenon and it's not terribly widespread beyond, let's say, the Anglosphere. So if you look, for instance, Africa is extremely multilingual, much of Asia is extremely multilingual, India is extremely multilingual. In China, well, the question is whether you would uh, classify, for instance, Southern Indian languages as languages of variants. I would say linguistically Cantonese is certainly as different from Mandarin as, let's say, French is from Italian and Spanish, and you wouldn't say that, you know, uh, France, Spain, and Italy have the same kind of common Romance language. So from this point of view, I would say, uh, and now within Europe, there is a huge number, continental Europe, huge number of people speaking, at least being able to communicate, maybe not perfectly, but being able to communicate in more than one language. So I would say the idea of monolingualism being default is particularly strong in Anglosphere. And it has something to do with the linguistic ideologies. So in a way, if you assume that there is a kind of hierarchy of languages, and English is on the top. Once you speak English, you don't need to learn anything else. Once you speak language number two, you have to learn English and nothing else. If you speak language number 10, then you have you know, several to kind of learn on your way. So from this point of view, I would say the, for me, the idea of monolingualism is very, very clearly connected with the idea of linguistic supremacy of one language over the other. And there will be people out there who will say, well, What's wrong with just speaking English? If you speak one language and another, what are the benefits of being multilingual? Uh, well, I mean, it's a kind of very, very long list. I mean, of course, if you know only one language, you don't know uh, what you will never experience. And uh, that is something that, I mean, let's say most multilingual people would say, I mean, it's, uh, you know, having only one language is like living, you know, in a world of black and white, or like, you know, even in a world where you go, you know, on holiday only to one place and never see anything else. So I would say the, the richness of experience that you will get by living in different languages is something which, in a way, I think will be very difficult to judge from one language because they don't have this experience. And I would say there are a lot of different advantages. Uh, I mean, one of the kind of very debated questions are, of course, the possible cognitive benefits and, let's say, uh, the fact that dementia 
seems to appear later, four to five years later, in uh, multilinguals than in monolinguals. But I would say there are a lot of other advantages. I mean, for me, it's simply the kind of richness of life experience, mm -hmm. which I would definitely not try to, you know, not, would not wish to lose. Um, what do you see as the objectives of having this day, uh, sort of further afield than just a celebration of multilingualism? Well, I would say our motto for the kind of first celebrations was multilingualism novel. So basically just trying to, I would say, trying to bring together the community of people who believe that it is normal, it is okay to speak different languages. An important point is, as I say, you don't need to speak them absolutely perfectly. I mean, the idea always is uh, that, you know, if you learn a language, you have to speak it like a native speaker. And then there is also this kind of idealization of native speaker, like, you know, being the perfect, perfect person who, you know, uh, speaks the perfect language. I would say not every English native speaker, for instance, is necessarily a Shakespeare, and not every German speaker is a Goethe. And, uh, and so from this point of view, I think it is, so to say, for me, it's a very much a kind of affirmative action showing that it is fine to learn languages, to know many languages, at different levels, whatever we perceive, so to say, as satisfactory at certain situa in certain situations, there are certain uh, stage of life, bringing people together and giving a positive, so to say, a, a positive approach to languages, because very often languages are perceived as something, ah, oh, it's effort, it's terrible, it's work, it's hard work, and so on. I would say just to kind of mention another of my uh, of my favorite um, activities, which is hill walking, which I cannot do at the moment because of COVID. You could also say, well, walking up the hill is terrible. I mean, you know, you you go up, you sweat, you, you know, you have to. Uh, get, it's an effort, but yet you go up, and then you have a fantastic experience. You see broader horizons and so on. So from this point of view, I would say yes, there is some effort attached to learning languages. But for me, it's a very positive, it's a very satisfactory effort. And that is something which, in a way, I would like to celebrate. So the kind of, to try to, well, correct the narrative from this cumbersome burden of language languages to the beautiful opportunity that we have to do it. Yeah, I mean, I can confirm as, as somebody who grew up speaking English as a first language, knowledge of French and German really helped me understand English better and actually to improve my English. So I was able to enjoy literature in a different way. I was able to understand many, many words that peers maybe didn't know automatically just because I already spoke French and then later learned German. And I, I can definitely agree with you on that, that uh, there are a lot of benefits. There is a wonderful citation by Goethe, whom I just mentioned, who said that whoever doesn't know foreign or other languages doesn't understand his own. So very much this, and this thought has been then picked up later by, uh, by uh, Lev Vygotsky, a famous, uh, very important Russian psychologist, who was then saying that in a way, learning a foreign language allows a child to develop a, abstract the ability of abstraction like learning so to say mathematical notation allows the abstraction of numbers because then suddenly it takes you so to say above so that you see the concepts not as the things but as concepts which can be different from in different languages i think it's a kind of wonderful metaphor that basically it's kind of elevates you and allows you to look down on language as a way of organizing the world rather than equating the language with the world. And people who are listening thinking, well, does my language or does my dialect count as multilingual? And should I take part? What would you say to them? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. I think it's, uh, it's a very, you know, it's a very difficult question where you draw the border between dialect and language. Uh, and uh, I would say a kind of wonderful example is exactly in Scotland, where I live now, where there is a big debate whether Scots 
is or should be recognized as a language or a dialect. Uh, I think, I mean, it has been clearly perceived as language with its own literary tradition, beautiful poetry, drama, uh, official legal texts, uh, documents, and so on, until 17th century, when it was kind of relegated to the position of, of you know, being a poor, poor um, a cousin of English. So from this point of view, I think, I would say it's a very, I, I would welcome all people who feel that whatever dialect they speak should in fact be recognized or even maybe should be recognized as a language rather than a dialect. And what kind of things will we do to celebrate? What kind of ideas do you have? Uh, well, I, I would say, I mean, fir uh, firstly, I would invite everybody to kind of contribute with new ideas. That's why we have this idea of having multilingual Mondays. So from now on until 27th of March, we want to post on Mondays, things that are relevant to languages, and we will be posting ourselves, but we invite everybody to put the hashtag multilingual Monday and post anything, quizzes, questions, links, and so on and so on. And in this way, we can kind of build the momentum. And in the last week, I mean, from the 20th, uh, from the, uh, I think, 22nd onwards, we'll have kind of daily posts to bring it up. There will be some, there will be some prizes for the best posts, uh, but we will tell it, so to say, we will uh, make, I mean, uh, decide a little bit later what exactly, or which kind of prizes exactly there will be, but there will certainly be some some reward for that so we hope to have we hope to have a dialogue we have to have an interaction and as i say with this day being a culmination and then i hope we'll have a online place where we can speak which starts when the day starts basically in new zealand and goes until it the sun goes down in hawaii so we want to have a truly global conversation about languages absolutely brilliant so I guess we'll have more information very soon about how people can get involved in terms of getting tickets or coming and signing up to, to join in on the day itself on the 27th of March. And also to get involved in the fun, the games, the quizzes, the questions and sharing and caring about multilingualism. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me, uh, Thomas, and for talking about uh, multilingualism and talking about this day and the celebration. It's been wonderful to talk to you as ever, and um, I'm looking forward to all of the things coming up now in the run-up to the 27th of March. My pleasure. See you then.